Hello and welcome to the Sensibly Speaking Podcast. This is Chris Shelton, your host. Thank you very much for inviting me into your home again this week. I am happy to be here. And this week, I have been actually looking forward to this chat for weeks now um, because I realized that we have a topic that we're going to talk about today that has not, and I've Googled this, I have looked for this, I've searched for this, and I believe I am absolutely correct when I say to you, this has not been discussed in any detail ever on any show ever having to do with Scientology, documentaries, films, uh, Netflix, whatever, YouTube videos. No one talks about this. Okay. And today I've got an opportunity to ask somebody about this. And I thought, you know, this is really an opportunity with a capital O. And so I've invited Mitch Brisker back onto my show. Hi, Mitch. Welcome back. Hey, guys. Hey, Chris. Nice <laughs> to see you again. Yeah, you too. And very happy to have you back. And you and yeah. I have had some very interesting conversations. You've been having very interesting conversations with a lot of people lately. <laughs> and uh, that's been going great. And everybody loves it. And um, we always appreciate new perspectives, new looks, updated information, et cetera, on what's going on inside the very non-transparent bubble world of Scientology. So it's good to have you around, and thank you for, for uh, coming back around here. My pleasure. Awesome. Now, this subject that I'm going to just dive right into, and while we're going on this, we may very well go down some other roads as well, as we are wont to do. Uh, talking with Mitch is an awful lot like talking with John Atack. We end up going all kinds of interesting places. But I think the central theme today is going to be focused on the OT levels and specifically an aspect of the delivery of the OT levels that, again, doesn't get talked about much. When you do, let me just set this up a little bit, Mitch, and then we can get into it, sure. okay? When you do the OT levels in Scientology, they are actually called the advanced courses. They're not thought of the same way as one-on-one -on -one auditing where an auditor sits in a room with you and gives you commands or gives you directions and you answer them and that's how the auditing goes. On the advanced courses, you have to learn how to do the procedure on yourself on OT levels one, two, three, and six and seven and eight. Those are solo audited levels. You're the only one in the room. Part of the training to do the auditing on yourself, it's called solo auditing, is not just how to use the e-meter and read it when you're sitting there in front of it writing down worksheets and doing commands on yourself, but part of the training involves seeing a series of films that L. Ron Hubbard made in the 1960s and 70s that are completely confidential have never leaked out of the church and are never talked about. The contents of these films simply aren't discussed anywhere. And that's what we're going to get into today is what are these films that students on the advanced courses, the OT levels, what do they watch? What are they learning? How does this contribute to their understanding of what they're doing in a session? These are the questions I want to ask Mitch about today. So, that all being said, Mitch, where should we start? You, you, you <laughs> remade or revised or, or well, no, no, updated no. Okay. these films, so they, right? They were they were all made in the sixties. In the sixties, they were all made. Yeah. I think there's six of them. I got to tell you, Chris, these films are so boring that <laughs> I spent hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours working on them. My role in them was to to, to first of all, let's get that out of the way. My role was to quote unquote um, restore them. Yes. So that falls under two categories. One, you have the, the ravages of time and and people not knowing how to preserve, take care of a film. So you have like, you know, fading and dust and scratches and all those kinds of things, which one would expect. Uh, a little less so with black and white because they were shot in black and white. Color, color is a much bigger problem. Mm. And the But the other thing we called restoration, which really wasn't, was more of upgrading them so that they didn't look like they were photographed 
by a person whose IQ was maybe not room temperature <laughs> right. or who, you know, couldn't read the instructions on the little sheet that comes with a can of Kodak film because they were so badly shot. Wow. Uh, zoom, you know, the camera would zoom in, go out of focus. You couldn't, it, it was a blob. Uh, it, it would be misframed. So half of Hubbard's body would be out of frame. And we had to figure out how to do like, we did. I, I shot body doubles. We stitched things together. We took images from different frames and and computer generated, uh, put them together, like Photoshop them, which, you know, on a, on a motion picture level of doing fo like Photoshop type retouching is way more dif difficult. I mean, if all they had to do was dust removal, scratch removal, you know, and, and update them in terms of the ravages of time, that would have been easy. But it was all the other stuff. I have to tell you one of them was so bad that it was never released and it was hubbard holding up five by seven cards and on the cards were ot2 commands because most most of the advanced course films are mostly about ot2 that's really what they're about mm. okay or now the do clearing, i have it or the clearing course or the clearing yes. course okay yeah because yeah, i because the, uh -huh. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, as I understand it, the clearing course and OT two are the are the most are the longest training sections on those OT level confidential materials. Is that's yeah, where you're going to have the beef? Yeah, yeah the beef yeah, is there. I, yeah, yeah, and I also think they they take the longest. I'm not sure yeah. about that, but yeah. I mean, Hubbard referred to OT2 as digging a ditch. It's just like yeah. we'll get into that, but you know, you go in every day and you do the work and you. You do the commands and you, you know, you just, it's, you know, it's like. It's kind of a slug fest. Yeah, it really is. It's, yeah. They're pretty much, for all intents and purposes, unrecognizable. The differentiation, really the only differentiation, if you're doing it as part of power processing, you know, the alternate route to clear, which yep. I don't know if you've talked about, but we can't. Mm -hmm. If you're doing it on the alternate route to clear, then it's you know, it's part of, uh, I guess, OT5, right? Not OT5, but what do they call it? Class, what do they call it? I forget. The clearing course. Uh, yeah, the clearing course. It's yeah. part of the clearing course. Yep. Uh, if you're doing it in OT2, then it's OT2, but you're going to see the same films and you're going to run the same processes. That's what I've always, that's the scene. That I'm really glad you just said that because that's a question yeah. I've had for years is that's what it, it looked like to me, but I couldn't be 100% no. sure. No, what, what, what was the thing in Pulp Fiction about? They call it a burger royale or a... a, a royale with a, cheese. Yeah, so one's a, it's a royale or cheese versus a cheeseburger. Right, Okay. right. <laughs> it's like same same thing. thing. Yeah, yeah. okay. Well, just to clarify for people, because we're talking about the middle of the Scientology bridge to total freedom, okay? The middle section is where you achieve the state of clear and you move on up to the OT levels. Well, it turns out that there's a couple different ways to achieve the state of clear. I mean, it's an imaginary state where you no longer have your own reactive mind, but Hubbard says that if you don't achieve it, doing the usual actions of Dianetics then right. there's this alternate route you can do, which is highly confidential, and that's called power and the clearing course. And there's steps you take, and it's a very formalized procedure. So apparently, when you're doing those steps, you are exposed to some of the same confidential materials that you'll be exposed to when everybody does OT 1, 2, and 3, and they do those levels yeah. and have to do the same material. I think I read in a promo material... Because I used to sell these to people without even knowing what that was right, on them. Right. And I'd said 90 hours of, of training on OT2. And I think it's comparable on the clearing course. I think it's very, very similar what you're covering there. Is that right? Yeah, as far as I know, because I yeah. did OT2, I didn't do uh, the clearing course. So. Right. But, but going through all course, these films, that, you know, it was yeah, the I films mean, for all these things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but the clearing course was. The original route to clear, though, right? Yeah, Saint Hill. That's it's right. Like, it, it it it's part of this bigger story where, back in at that time, you you went to what if you wanted to go clear, you had to go to Saint Hill and become a class six auditor, <laughs> and this was a huge waste in the hourglass, yeah, uh, of forward progress for Scientologists and all of Scientology, uh, because the 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 uh, how would you say it? Uh, class six became the gatekeeper for going clear. I mean, right. It, it was pretty insane. So I, I, 
we did a film about this called the uh it's called the solo auditor course film not the solo course film which is a training film there's another film which was intended to sign people up for uh i think for the clearing course if they needed it so that's why hubbard came out with the solo auditors course so because he claimed oh no no, no i figured out a way that i can take you and just train you to be a classics auditor just for what you're going to need to audit solo and that's what a solo auditor is right. a, a solo auditor is a classics auditor who's but only a specialized slice of it it's really quite a, a gambit because you know it, he needed to bust their income open right well exactly he bottlenecked the bridge at clear yeah, he bottlenecked it so he's like so oh, shit. he had to unbottleneck right? it right so he unbottlenecked it with the solo course but then some people couldn't you know, talk themselves into going clear, I guess. They were kind of like, I think some of them, because they knew there was this alternate, this is just my theory, mm -hmm. because they knew there was this alternate route, which had been the original route to clear, which we are, you are not allowed to call it that. Like, you never would see that in your promo, mm -hmm. uh, because then it would seem like, well, why wouldn't I just do the original route? So it, it, had, it had to be called the alternate route, just as a marketing thing. That's and, right. Um, and uh, for yeah, a while, remember... hardly anybody was doing the alternate route. It was like 5% of people who were going up the bridge were doing that. Yeah, but then I think it became a bigger deal. Well, it did after. There there came a point, interestingly, after, after Miscavige started talking about this so much, where it started becoming a larger percentage of people. That was actually just as I was leaving. That was really starting to happen. Yeah, I yeah. think that was around the time we made the solo editor course film because I mm. remember working on the script and it was like, no, 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 this is not the original route to clear. Right. Because why wouldn't you want to do that? What do you want? You want Mama's original recipe, <laughs> or do you want Mama's newfangled, or you want the original one? Right. 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 Interesting. Uh, yeah. So, but anyway, it, I, it's it's part of this bigger story about uh, you know about classics and I mean there isn't classics anymore, right? Well, exactly. That's they, all been taken apart. I guess apart. they're going to bring it back if, whenever they don't need to because the, they now joined the 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 school of we live on donations along with the Mormon Church and a lot of other people. So exactly, yeah, they don't have to worry about being sued for making false promises because they're like we would rather just take your money and give you nothing. That's right. Than take your money and give you something you might sue us for. So anyway, we're getting that's a little off the subject. Yeah, um, it's, it's 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 pretty pretty on there. So yeah. <laughs> so how so this alternate route being kind of what it is, and there being yeah. these you know again kind of zeroing in on the films aspect of this because when you study and learn how to do this stuff, you're trying to learn how to be a solo auditor, and you're trying to learn enough of what Hubbard is trying to impart to you that you understand what it is you're dealing with when you do the clearing course or when you do OT one, two, and three. Yeah. What, what are you doing, right? So, okay. so, so what's okay. what's in this stuff? How does he break it down? Well, you said they were very boring. That's interesting to me. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, so um, I'd seen the films in their original form. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, scratchy and misframed and out of focus, and like, you know, you had to play the emperor's new clothes with them. Like, whoa, that's amazing that we even have any image at all of Hubbard doing this. I mean, these are the most important films in the history of mankind. I mean, right. that's like how they're looked at, right. like these horrible films. So then the second time I encountered them was when I was working at Gold as the senior director. We uh, we were kind of going up the bridge from uh, tiers and objectives, you know, when we did the survival rundown course. And I was working on these, what were called registration films, part of the reg lineup. Oh, these were like sales videos or films. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So these you, weren't you, to train; uh, these were to sell the service. Yeah, but we were kind of going up in order, right? And then yeah. we we got we got to the point, uh, and then we you know we did the tech films. We did uh, you know obviously we did the solo film. So it was kind of the next logical thing was to start restoring these horrific looking old old films. These these film lectures that Hubbard had done. And the first one we did was the class and grad film, which I think might be out there. It might be on YouTube. It's the it one is. Hubbard... The classification yeah. and gradation chart, you mean? 
yeah class and grad yeah we, yeah. we, yeah, we call it the, yeah we call it sorry we call it the class and grad film so. right it's yeah, hubbard believe me in that world you don't have time for extra syllables Dan. you only got 15 minutes for lunch you're exactly gonna, well okay so your time so that film was a restored film of l ron hubbard giving the initial lecture on what is now what we call the bridge to total freedom the classification and gradation chart yeah i think that was the initial release of yep. that yeah i remember when that was revised and they colorized it and 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 put it out i remember that yeah and i yeah that's when we did that we restored it it was really a pretty interesting restoration i mean there was some technology used in that restoration Mm -hmm. uh i have to tell you though just to put things in a little bit of context there's a gold video uh it's an official video called inside golden art productions which i was featured in Mm -hmm. and i am just about to release a reaction video to it and in that in that video i talk about these restorations i put up some examples of black and white films shot in the 19 in 1960 when 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 the film that they're showing the class they show a piece of the classic rap film i can tell that's what it is because of the rug hanging behind it right (laughs) He used to use these carpets for backdrops, which yeah. I don't understand why, because he looked like a carpet salesman. <laughs> I know. Like, they look so cheap. I was like, wow, yeah, man. Even when really, I was in, I was like, wow, that does yeah, not look good. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this guy's living in like, you know, a, a, a you know, a, a mansion, right? I mean, not even a, ma- a manor. A manor. Uh, and he's hanging up, uh, you know, these curtains, but, but whatever. Um but anyway, I, I I compared it. I said like these films were shot in the golden age of black and white cinematography. It's literally you you could you, it would be so easy to do a better job. I don't know how they did them so badly. Especially this was at the same time that he was. Remember he he used photography as the focus for the study technology. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like like it, he knew nothing about photography. So in in researching how people learn things, he said, well, I'm going to learn photography. Everybody who st- does study technology in Scientology, which is everybody eventually, you're going to learn uh, your terms in photography and you're going to learn some basic photographic principles because he's going to he talk about them. That's so right. it kind of amazed me that it, he was such a, you know, a, a kind of a photocentric individual and that he would accept this kind of quality, especially for films that were so important. I thought, like, why didn't he just reshoot them? It's it's like an afternoon's work. Any one of these films is like nothing. It's one camera set up. It's, it's a, like a medium shot and some close-ups. And you could just run through it twice, or you could do it with two cameras or whatever. But it would be like, one of them was so bad, and we'll talk about how we fixed it, that it was never released. It was it was him literally holding up five by seven cards, right? And uh, whenever he'd hold one of the cards up, the cameraman would punch in. He'd zoom in real quickly, and the card would go completely out of focus. You couldn't read it. So the film was just never released, and the commands for OT2 were on those cards. Like, why wouldn't they reshoot it? I can never figure that out like wow y- you would have to just not give a shit like y- right i mean why would you not care if it was important enough to do it exactly uh, they they still had the cards because obviously they kept everything he ever did um and w- anyway I'll, we, we we'll get into it but i'm not answering your question was about what is the content well believe it or so i spent all this time looking at them so many times uh making notes how are we going to fix things you know, making a note about we need to research how to figure that out. And one of the interesting anecdotes about anecdotes about this is I had done a commercial before I ever worked for Gold back in my commercial uh, director days. And I had done this commercial for this company called Allegheny International. And they own Sunbeam and they make, you know, jet airplanes and they make like uh, – the air cleaning systems for nuclear submarines and all this kind of crazy stuff. And so we did like a corporate ad, you know, one of these ones they show on CNN news hour and to get money to invest in the company. Cause it's, it's not a consumer product. Um, you know, like you see these things for like, you know, how wonderful, uh, uh, 
Standard Oil is because they do work on the reefs with uh, helping the environment. Oh, sure. Yeah, that, yeah. I've seen tons yeah, of those, those commercials. Those aren't to sell you gas. Right. Those are to get people to buy stock in the company. Mm -hmm. Right. And those are called corporate ads as opposed to consumer retail, whatever. Sure. So I've done this corporate ad for this company, Allegheny International, and the guy that I did it for had come out of uh, – the the intelligence sector as a private contractor he was a computer programmer who had worked on some advanced image enhancement software and i remember him like joking with me about how oh yeah we can read the we can read the 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 logo on a golf ball from a satellite uh, so i never forgot that so when we were working on these films one of the things we, we obviously the idea of image enhancement, the idea of taking an out of focus image and bringing it into focus. And they were con they were contracting with these companies in Hollywood to license software that they use on motion pictures. And I said, well, you know, I think you should be talking to the intelligence community, not Hollywood, because mm. these are the guys that really have the gnarly image enhancement uh, software. And sure enough, they, they called a few companies and they, they landed with one and they were like, yeah, and it was like much cheaper than the Hollywood guys and the software was much more powerful. So we actually had some pretty amazing tools for enhancing the software. Interesting. So, uh, I mean, they didn't they didn't let us read golf balls from outer space. Well, I guess but, you, know, you can't get everything yeah, you we want, could, right? Uh, we could read body things with their software. There you go. Uh, so, yeah, so we use a lot of pretty amazing technology to do it. But I got to tell you, with all of the hundreds and hundreds of hours I spend studying the films and trying to figure out how to redo them, I can all, barely remember three of them. And I can only remember wow. two of the titles uh, and, and some of the content, which I think you're – viewers will find really interesting yes there's for sure. one yeah there's one okay so in terms of the content there's a thing well there's one of the films is called gpms i know you're familiar with this 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 term but yeah. you might want to tell people what yeah that means. let me let me let me explain this one because it's a little okay. weird yeah, it's a little um, obtuse. yeah it is a little obtuse this is now this is deep Scientology minutia we're talking right now, okay? This is yeah, like technical yeah. stuff. It's sort of where Hubbard goes to help explain why people are so fucked up, right? Why people act the way that they right. do. And he says right. that you have, in Dianetics in 1950, Hubbard forwarded the idea that there were engrams. There were these incidents of pain and unconsciousness, and that's what's causing all your trouble is the, is the, the reactive restimulation of these, you know, engrams and you have to replay them like a dummy and, you know, and that's what causes all your problems. Well, he later said in the 1960s, uh, he said, look, actually, these engrams are actually cloistered together and create these black masses in the reactive mind because what you've been doing over your lifetimes is you have been moving forward as a spiritual entity from life to life to life. You've had big long term goals okay this is the g in gpm it's goals you've had goals as a spiritual entity that that supersede any one life you're trying to be the good guy you're trying to bring justice to the galaxy so you have a series of lifetimes where you're the cop you're a policeman you're a justice you're in, you're a soldier you're the good guy and that's a series of lifetimes you engage in but you encounter problems when you are in count when you're trying to carry this goal out you run into problems and the problems you run into are energy related you're putting out energy as a spiritual being to enact your goals and you're met with counter force or counter energy by the universe, by other thetans, by other spiritual beings, and this this meeting of this of this energy is like two fire hoses shooting water at each other. It just bundles up in the middle, and it's not, and it's just a big confusion. It's a big mass, and that's the GPM. It's the goal problem mass. It's this energy mass, the deposit that that accumulates over time, over your lifetimes, in your reactive mind. You're carrying this energy around with you, and by defusing it, by taking it apart, 
through the auditing procedures of Scientology, you address these GPMs, rip them apart, and and there are thousands and thousands of engrams connected with every single one of these things. And you take them apart, and that's what causes you to go clear. That's what blows your reactive mind. That's what that's the secret sauce at the bottom of of Dianetics and Scientology is these GPMs. And you take them apart, and they're very, very powerful. And this is what's supposed to be causing people to be insane, be crazy, act crazy, do crazy things. And that's kind of at the heart of the whole thing. How, what did you think? Does that, did I get it right? You blew my mind. I'm ready to sign up. <laughs> it was really good. I just, I want to add one little thing that I remember. Because yes. you mentioned the opposing fire hoses. So in the, in the, within the midst of those opposing forces, there is a stasis. There's a point of of complete stillness. Yes. And that stillness is your inability to act because of these opposing forces. Yeah. So just to make sure you're thoroughly understanding how much these things are screwing you over. <laughs> That's so, right. That's within right. There with and, all that force. And we're, and and we're talking energy. about and we're talking about literal energy, real mass, real energy. Hubbard yeah. says this is real physical universe stuff. It's yeah, not imaginary. This isn't an analogy. This yeah. is the real deal. This is how he says the universe works. Yeah. Okay. 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 So there's this film called GPM. So we know that the the reactive mind. We know the mind is, contains only pictures. We know this from Dianetics, yep. right? There's nothing in your mind. And the, and, the, and, and the proof of that is think of a cat, you get a picture of a cat. And supposedly that's supposed to prove that your mind is composed of pictures, right? That's right. Um, but it doesn't actually say what the mind, what the reactive mind, which is composed of these moments of pain and unconsciousness, it, it, it says what's in it, but it doesn't say what it is made of. Oh, like that this gets really magical. Yep. And and so it, what it's made of is GPMs. Like that's what the reactive mind is actually made out of. And so the way that you deconstruct this thing is by running this pr pr process, which is uses what are called dichotomies. Did you hear about this? I did. Go ahead and explain. Yeah, okay. So, but that this is key. What, what's a dichotomy? Yeah, well, it's, it's it's a similar definition to the word as we know it, which is a, a thing with its opposite, right? Mm -hmm. But on the clearing course or on OT2, the dichotomies are phrased as can't have, must have. So you have to find an item. I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but mm -hmm. you're going to find it. You're going to use the E meter to locate a bunch of different items that are pertinent to you. And then you're going to run them as dichotomies. Let's say your item, as he uses the example, your item is cats. The dichotomy would be must have cats, can't have cats. Mm -hmm. So these dichotomies are run as must have, can't have. Those are the opposing forces that are causing the two sides of that of that of those two fire hoses to collide right. must have can't have so you 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 get on your e meter and you you do what's called a list and you find what are called reading items items that read on the e meter from your life they could be anything and then you run this as must have can have and you do it and i don't remember the exact form but you do it in what's called a bracket yeah and you do these brackets endlessly over and over and over again and you keep very exacting notes about how you do them yep. and so you know you get the it's it's but in it's the a film, very I mean, mechanical process. It's extremely. That's he yeah. said this like digging a ditch. You're yep. just going to get out there every day, and you're going to you know just throw dirt over your shoulder. That's right. And so and so you do. You go in there, and you just you know you're like, well, I'm just going to have a you know four or five hours this afternoon of like digging this imaginary stuff out of this imaginary mental construct. Um, that's right. So yeah, one of the films specifically deals with that, and he's got a, 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 a what do you call it? Like a, you know, like an easel with a big drawing pad, and he's doing all the sketches of the dichotomies, and then there's a, there's another one that's called, I believe it's Patterns of the Bank. Yes, this or is, Pattern of the GPM. She's something like yeah, that. It has the uh -huh. worst patterns. I mean, I just never wrote these things down. <laughs> uh, I, I think that. 
I think after a while, I would just I just did so much of it that it just like went away when it was done, when the whole thing was done. It was like I just didn't need to retain any of that. But there is one famously where he Hubbard has built. He's got a table like two, like a couple of tape, like folding tables in front of him. And on the table, he's got a model of the reactive mind, uh, a clay model that's maybe six inches deep and maybe three inches high uh, and maybe 12 feet long, right? It's huge. And he has a knife and he's going to, and it's got a bunch of patterns and weird like symbology uh, etched, like drawn into it. And then he goes through and he slices this thing off, showing you how you take the reactive mind apart. So he literally gives you a, a demonstration in clay about how this is done. That's it. Yeah, that is so off. interesting because I've actually yeah. seen over the years there have been released one or two photographs from that lecture of him holding up a piece of clay or him sitting there doing yeah. something, but yeah. but never any context or explanation or captioning yeah. of what it's yeah, about. It's just a picture of Ron, you know? Yeah, he's taken apart the reactive mind with a butter knife. Right. Is, <laughs> I, guess that's one, <laughs> I guess that's one way to do it. I'm, I'm uh, going in session. Hey, why are you going in session with a butter knife? I right. said, well, that's, that's what I saw in the film. Right. Uh, right. But yeah, it was pretty crazy. So then there was this one film that had the, the, the commands on it, right? The one that he would hold up mm -hmm. and it would go completely out of focus to the point where you, it just looked like a, like a white cotton ball. Like you couldn't read. Literally, there wasn't even markings on it. So that one was just shelved, which I never understood because that was one of the most important films. It had the commands on it. And even though he'd said what they were in the other films and they were mm -hmm. written out and so forth, but still. So... But like I said, they had the cards in archives, right? So I mean, you could have digitally out. recreated that pretty easily, I think, at this point. Well, but point. you couldn't have, from what? You couldn't see the cards anywhere. Well, no, the, but if you had the cards in archives, you just said, right? Couldn't you just digitally recreate them on the screen? Uh, maybe. When uh, you focused no, in on you, them? No, you you no? have to recreate the whole image. Like, yeah. you have to... But when he zoomed in, it just zoomed into a white field of blob. Oh, yeah. No, like, you'd have to composite another image on top of that with a clear card. No, but right? as soon as he started to zoom, it went out of focus. So what were you going to composite? I, I, it wasn't I, like it went out of focus at the in the last moment or something. Right. So you'd have to it's maintain so we, the same focus as yeah, it goes in. It would be like a special a, effect, wouldn't it? Like a digital special effect or something? Yeah, but there's no effect like the real thing, right? <laughs> so what I did was we found a guy, and this was not the only time we did this. We did this a lot. We found a guy who had whatever the physical characteristics we needed that matched Hubbard. Mm -hmm. He had uh, extraordinarily long fingers and thick wrists. Like his fingers were, if you look at photos of him and you specifically look, you'll see his fingers are really long. Mm. Like it's really hard to match his hand. It's a very unique looking hand. Mm. Uh, like he, he would have made a great quarterback because this guy could have like <laughs> fingered a football like nobody's <laughs> nobody's business. How interesting. Uh, yeah, you'll notice that now that I said yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. I'm sitting here going, wow, I've never noticed that about Hubbard before, but now I'm going to yeah, see no, it. <laughs> I don't, and I don't even mean in a, in a deformed way, but he had these really long, like for a man of his sort of size, you'd think his fingers would be a little thicker. Yeah. But they were actually, he had kind of long, elegant hands, right? Interesting. It looked like he'd never done a day of work in his life. Um so I had to find a guy I found, and you know, it's not only that that looked like his hands, but who was, uh, you know, physically phys physically intelligent enough, aware enough of their body to actually mimic, you know, do the hand acting because it's, you know, he does things in a very specific way. And of course, we had the original film for the guy to study. So I found this guy, middle aged guy, who he happened to be a a retired Navy SEAL. And uh, uh, maybe it was his past training or something, but he got really had a great sense of mimicking the hand motions. Uh, so we had him. You know, I we literally recreated the set. Uh, had a guy recreated the jacket. They may even have the jacket. I don't know. Wow. But in any in any case, we recreated the costume, the set, everything perfect. 
and then and then just shot this guy to it. And then, you know, you can cut on the action, which is a very typical way of editing. When a person starts to starts to make an action, you cut you find an appropriate point in the action to cut in on. And that that smoothly carries your eye across the edit, which is just standard editing practice. So we, I, I, you know, <laughs> we, they are the original cards. So at least the, it, we have that, but it was not hovered. The, there is a number of films where some part of somebody else's body was photographed. How and, you know, we just spent hours like, you know, getting a perfect take that matched the other take. It was really quite an undertaking, but that was one mm -hmm. I was particularly proud of. So there, there was uh, another one where he had another shot might've been in that same film where he had, uh, a box of of like folded paper, like rolled paper, like tubes of paper that he w showed uh, in the film. And he had like a black cloth draped over the, t the paper. And then he spoke. And then at a certain point, you know, like a magician, he whipped the, 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 the cloth and revealed what was inside. And so that was one of the edit points. You know, we built an exact wow. duplicate of that. And as the guy whipped it off, literally the, the black cloth, covered, you know, wiped the camera. And then we were cut in however many years that ago that was. It was quite, quite a lot. Uh, so, yeah, it was. we did some real trickery to, to re bring those films up to looking decent. Wow. And the main majority, the, the, the majority of the films had to do either with Clearing Course or OT2, which ends up, again, being pretty much the same thing. Were there any? I yeah. don't. There are no films on OT three, are there? No, I didn't the think only so. Films, the only films of the OT two clearing course. Just OT two and clearing course. Okay, so OT one yeah, no, does not have a a film set either. Then no, no. There was one of the films which I want to talk about. One other aspect mm -hmm. uh, of of how badly they were done. Yeah. Um. They, one of them was shot, they were all shot at St. Hill, except one of them was shot in South Africa. I'm assuming mm -hmm. maybe Johannesburg, because mm -hmm. uh, uh, that would kind of make sense, because they were shot around the time he did the Hitchman interview. Yeah, which, yeah. Which would, I don't know if that was down time. in Rhodesia or if that was in South Africa. Yeah, I don't know. It could have been in Rhodesia, but I it, yeah. it seemed to me he was kind of on his own in Rhodesia, so it would have been diff difficult for him to to. Oh, do he had people filming. around him. Yeah, he must have. He, yeah, yeah. He's not going to go any. He's no, no. Go he had an entourage. He had, he had yeah, people. Yeah. yeah, so maybe it was Rhodesia, but... This, okay, so just to back up a little bit, mm -hmm. you, you mentioned people around him. I would hear this name Red Sharp yep. constantly. I would yeah. hear it from Miscavige. I would hear that Red Sharp is the guy who shot these films, and he's the guy that screwed them up, and um... he's the SP who ruined the advanced court the ot films and i would hear this over and over and over and you know this guy had been banished by l ron hubbard to you know the far distant prison of the universe for you know and, and declared an sp for a ten thousand lifetime i mean for maybe a year and a half that i worked on this project i cannot remember the number of times he Miscavige kept mentioning Red Sharp. Yep. Red Sharp. Yeah. So then a few days ago, I'm watching Mark Fisher and Janice Grady's uh, channel, you know, Peeling the Engine, you know, our Scientology stories, which I highly recommend because they are the history channel of SBTV. Um, and they started talking about Red Sharp. Now, realize I had no context of Red Sharp outside of he was the guy that because of him, I was having to do all this work. And so then they mentioned these other things about Red Sharp, which I never knew, like that he was so close with Hubbard that when Hubbard went away, he left Red Sharp in charge of worldwide headquarters for all of Scientology. He, he also loaned Hubbard, according to Janice's information, loaned Hubbard the money to buy St. Hill Manor. And according to them, uh, he never paid him back. He just declared him an SP before the loan came how so. interesting that's a new piece yeah, of so, information to me because reg was somebody that hubbard actually gave shout outs to in his lectures all like, the time like everybody knows about reg he's in the study yeah. tapes you know he talks about him all the time yeah yeah and, next to mary sue i think he's the most mentioned scientologist in the lectures yeah, yeah but the inside dope on reg wow. from my perspective from what i was hearing was he was the sp 
Right. Who? Uh, so anyway, I wrote Janice an email. I wrote her and I said, hey, you know, I spent like a year and a half fixing up, blah, blah, blah. I told her the whole story of Miscavige. I was just constantly uh, talking about Red Sharp. So then she sent an email to Ken Urquhart, who was Hoover's uh, butler, right? Yep. And he, he, and he said, well, I wasn't, I didn't actually, I wasn't at the shoots. I remember the films being shot, the clearing course films. Mm -hmm. uh, I wasn't there because I'm not, case-wise, I couldn't be there. He wasn't high enough up the bridge, right? Mm -hmm. Ken, uh, Ken wasn't. But he does not remember. This is Hubbard's butler who mm -hmm. knew every fight, every flap, every argument, everybody who was in trouble. And he said he never recalled Hubbard being mad at him or of Red Sharp even having anything to do with shooting them. So oh. like, this is just like, what? This is just one of these great mysteries that I, you know, I mean, I, it doesn't surprise me that that. You know, you know, especially, well, not just especially, but in Scientology and especially in the Sea Org, it's, it's, uh, it's such a blame game. You know, there, there always has to be like a bad guy, right? And if there isn't one, you just pick one. Because That's right. some bad thing cannot happen without it being somebody's fault. So in this case, it was just all blamed on this dead guy who got burned on a loan. <laughs> For that is these films. amazing and probably yeah, I was a shit face if you hadn't asked me chris yeah. to talk about these films i would not have e i emailed janice because i i heard them talking about reg and i went whoa they must know about right. reg screwing these films up and, and lrh's butler was like what you so just like well that's and it's all too typical that's exactly what happens almost every time we start you know, chasing these breadcrumbs and going all the way down to the source is you find out, and Miscavige himself probably just had, um, you know, Hubbard complain to him about this at some point in all the years that Hubbard and Miscavige were, were talking and Miscavige just ran with it. You know, yeah. it's probably Hubbard yeah. just throwing Reg under the bus and Miscavige going, oh, absolutely. Yeah. What a dick, right? Because of course, Miscavige picked up as you and I have talked about at length and in detail, yeah. this exact pattern of operation is you find yeah. a scapegoat. And as long as you got somebody to blame, you're blameless as the leader. That's, that is, that is cult leader 101, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So there you go. Of it, course, Reg was yeah, going to get so, it, so you then, know? So then he goes to South Africa for whatever reason. I don't know. I mean, Rhodesia or probably Rhodesia. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, he shot one film there of himself giving himself a solo session. It's a demonstration of a solo session. That's right? what the one from down there. Okay. Because I knew he yeah, shot you, one down there, but I couldn't remember which one. And you may have seen this because I don't think it's confidential because there's nothing confidential. Uh, all of the solo materials are the part A solo materials are not that confidential. That film is con is marked as confidential, even if it yeah. even if it doesn't have may, any confidential maybe info some in of, it. Maybe some yeah. of the commands are, but you know, like this, even though you can only see it, the the solo editor course film, which takes you all the way through how to set up and run a solo session. That's not a confidential film. No, that one's not. Um, yeah. The checklist for setting up a solo session is not a comp confidential bulletin, right? Right. So uh, I guess, but there is part B of solos, so that's confidential. Correct. So, but he he's gives himself a solo session with the old Mark V, the wooden meter. Yeah. And he's using a pair of 35 millimeter film cans which I thought was kind of odd because little uh, tiny he, cans for his big ass tiny, hands. Yeah. Yeah. He had, he had really big hands. Yeah. And he and used I little tiny was, cans. Yeah. I thought that was strange because in the film, how to set up a session in the emitter, when the messenger is going over can size with yeah. the auditor and he says, we had L, L. Ron Hubbard's voice. So I said, I can't get it out of my head. And these, I can't do L. Ron Hubbard. And these are for a child or a person with small hands. And yep. they were 35 millimeter film cans. So I never understood why he was solo auditing with those. I mean, solo cans were considerably smaller than regular cans. So, uh, so but my point is, so this one film, um, he goes to South Africa. And according to Ms. Gavage, he tells Red Sharp, if you touch the camera, I'm going to you know, comment you, right? I'm going to explain you for something. So they set the camera up. The whole film is one angle. It's just one well-composed angle, shows what it needs to show. And it's it's locked 
off. It doesn't need to be attended to. And and supposedly he tells Red Sharp, if you touch the camera, you know, like I'm going to break your hands or whatever. Right. And this film is perfectly shot, except Hubbard, the expert on photography, the world's leading authority in photography, decides that he's going to open the curtains and let this wonderful South African light in, <clears throat> not applying... Cinematography 101, which is you have to control the environment, not realizing that these big, beautiful billowy clouds are going to be drifting in front of the sun all day long. And so he shoots this film and it gets darker yep. and then it gets lighter and then it gets darker yep. and then it gets lighter. Yep. And so <laughs> total had... amateur move, man. I've made it yeah, myself. A... Yep. Yeah. You after learn. he told the guy, after he told the guy. <laughs> You know, there's no need for you to move the camera because I'm going to make sure that the lighting is so screwed up that it won't matter. So uh, I have to tell you that that particular error, filmically, is really difficult to fix. Mm -hmm. uh, we we even the light out, but, but because so many other things change when the light dims, the contrast changes. Mm -hmm. So you can't just light it up because the image is more grayed out. And so, yeah. but we were able to smooth that thing out, but it was just, I mean, to me, that was a constant source of amusement that he told the guy, um, don't you dare cut your camera, but I think I'll open the windows and get some beautiful light. So I, anyway. I, I know it was very, it's very funny to me what a dilettante Hubbard was while he railed continually through his entire yeah. lecturing life yeah. against yeah. dilettantes. And that's yeah. all he was. He, he had a passing interest and the church makes it out I, norman starkey you know and the whole auto you yeah. know the whole biography thing make it out that he's fully professional in 27 different professions or something yeah no well, he wasn't he was barely competent in most of his supposed yeah. professions yeah. you know yeah absolutely well, mind-blowing he was more daring than a lot of people mm -hmm. but daring one man's daring is another man's just you know foolishly well, you know dangerously yeah you know. exactly i mean I, I legit he he barnstormed great you know legit yeah. he was a flyer great yeah legit he was a sailor fine yeah you know and he's yeah. been out on the yeah. ocean and he loves it out there great you know that's wonderful hubbard wasn't yeah. a coward in everything but when it came to, you know, yeah. combat and the war and actually facing his responsibilities or dealing well with people like Red Sharp or his wives, yeah. it, the, the guy folded like an accordion, you know, it was just, it's hilarious yeah. watching this guy. Well, if anybody out there in, in, in your universe knows anything additional about Red Sharp's relationship mm. with L. Ron Hubbard or with the films or who shot the films, I mean... I don't think anybody would know more than Ken Urquhart, but he was just like, didn't know. He just didn't even remember them being shot. And he was with Hubbard. No, he remembered them being shot, but he he did not remember ever Hubbard having a falling out with uh, Reg Sharp. Right. It's very strange. I mean, just getting back to the subject of the photography, what was most interesting me, to me was Hubbard had one of the most amazing um, collections of analog photo equipment. I mean, just like they had it up at gold, you know, they had yeah. all this, this, this museum dedicated to his, uh, possessions and they had, uh, the, the, there was, uh, there used to be a part of the CMO called CMO gold, which, which, uh, Miscavige disbanded, but the CMO gold was responsible for all of Hubbard's photo gear. And I mean, I was just like, I, I would just drool, just so green with envy, <laughs> seeing all these amazing cameras that he had. And he read so many books. He did the, uh, when he was researching photography for uh, study technology, research, researching how people learn things, he did the NYIT, the New York Institute of Technology course. Have you ever heard about this? I have. I have heard about yeah, it. it. I've heard it's, it's quite it's, good. It's, yeah, it's really good. It's a very prestigious, very legitimate. Anybody can do it. It's a certificate. It's a well-regarded certificate in professional photography. Um, the Gold actually has a deal with the school that they're able to teach it locally. They're able to, to uh, not as a correspondence course. Somehow, I think they do send stuff into the school, but they're able 
they have they have a, a couple of instructors there that are either fully certified to give it or are certified to administer it and then send the stuff in something right mm -hmm. but my point is with all of these resources and all of this the time spent and invested he was such a bad photographer and a horrible cinematographer that it is just it's just mind-boggling isn't it isn't that really something i ca yeah. i can't imagine i mean well I've tr i'm trying but let me ask you i mean you go up there as a scientologist and professional yeah. trained film technician yeah. right it's in, you know cinematography direction etc mm -hmm. and you're confronted with you know this this uh, array of nonsense that hubbard has put together in actually this is a nice segue because i've been wanting to ask you about this too the cine eds right all these yeah. advices all this literature that hubbard wrote with his own two hands on how to make cinematography work how to do films all these tapes of him directing that you had to listen to like there's just this wealth of information and of course he was a pack rat so you got all the stuff right there you know even the cards the three by five cards from a film from the 1960s so it must have really been something to go up there and bit a bit of a dream but then to see the reality of the stark lack of talent and professionalism in the face of all of this knowledge and money and and stuff it must have really thrown you for a loop yeah, I mean, I was being paid decently, so I was, <laughs> that softens the loop. So, you was know, it really? Did you really fall back on the money? Is the thing that made that cushion eventually, like okay? Eventually, eventually, when the money got good enough, but by that time, the crew had so much. Listen, eventually, uh, eventually, they made some very good films. I mean, you've seen some of the stuff. Sure, you, sure. You've tuned into the station, so it it, it took years, but eventually, um, I was able to get them into a crew, but. You know, I believed in the mission, Chris. So it was totally. kind of like, totally. yeah, it was kind of like you're there. You're really into it. You're like, wow, I'm really needed here. I can really do some good work. And it was like, it, you weren't starting. I, I didn't have to start from scratch, right? Right. Like the script supervisor had read the same book and studied the same book that students at USC or UCLA or NYU or any place else had studied. Like they'd studied this stuff. I mean, the main difference is they were under a threat of of uh, retaliation for screwing up. Right. Which does does have an effect on your creative performance. Yeah. Right. Because uh, somebody who's trying to make an independent film in their last year at NYU isn't worried about being thrown into the RPF. Right. You know, there, so there is that. But so they had a lot of the the same technology like like the books I, and i think we've talked about this before the books that they had were the books that i had that i studied but then they were so, but wasn't this also and, and i'm just trying to understand okay i'm not trying to be argumentative but i am wondering a yeah, little yeah. bit like you go in there and you're trained without all that weird pressure right you don't have a yeah. threat of the rpf over you when you're in film school making films you go up there, and yes, they are exposed to the same information in terms of training materials, but then they're given this additional layer of what I what I think is probably complete horseshit in the name of L. Ron Hubbard's advices and directions, and here's how you do color, and here's how you do lighting, and here's how you do this, and here's how you do that. But am I right in that? Were his cine uh, EDs? You're kind, of, you're, kind of putting me, you're kind of putting me on the spot. Oh, am I? Because I, yeah, because oh, I don't okay. want to. I don't want to. I don't want to come off like I'm defending it. Um, oh, not meaning to. Not meaning to try. No, to, I know that. Yeah, no, 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 okay. no, 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 Chris. This is okay. part of our vibrant uh, dialogue. This isn't like some argumentative thing. Yeah, yeah. At all, at all. So I, when I say you're putting me on the spot, it, this is just part of our dialogue. It's not like. Like, how dare you put me on the spot? Please put me on the spot. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not just here. I'm also here for myself to decultify. Sure. So um, the cine EDs, okay, here's yeah. a couple of things to understand about them. I found some of the information. Most of it is okay. Most of the stuff, especially on audio. Mm. Hubbard did much better with audio, with recording technology if you ask me to pick which one of the of the cinematic arts mm -hmm. uh which the cine eds deal with the cinematic arts which would be directing acting writing uh, a little bit not much on writing uh everything makeup 
audio, set recording, music mixing. There's a lot of music stuff that the audio uses, which are also included in the Cine EDs. So the best of it would be the audio stuff. The worst of it would be the the theory, like film theory. Mm -hmm. He had some really nutty ideas on film theory, like his idea of timelessness gave you the professional TRs film, gave you that horrifically bad taste film because you know, he, he wrote this cine ED that said the films should take place in the year zilch, right? So as I, I think I said before in another interview, yep. he wanted to take every anything out that would date the film. So all that was left was things nobody wanted to see uh, in, in a film artistically or otherwise. So that stuff was really bad. Uh, the makeup stuff was not bad, but we had horrific problems with makeup. Really? Uh, to the yeah, to the point where we had to bring in some top Hollywood pros. We brought in one of what's his name, Westmoreland. I'm trying to think. Uh, I should look it up. Mm. Um, he was one of the, the 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 towering pillars of Hollywood makeup. Mm. I mean, this guy. Uh, he had one kid who was in makeup, and he had like three children. And I asked him, I said, how come only one of your kids went into makeup? And uh, he, the, the others didn't want to. He said, oh, no, 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 they, they all wanted to. Only one of them was good enough. <laughs> wow. <laughs> no, telling, oh, no, this guy was like, wow. when we were doing the confessional TRs and we were shooting with all that live fire, Yeah. the angel, the, the actress playing the angel, her makeup wouldn't last an hour in that heat and with all of that dirt from all of the stuff burning. Yeah. And so the makeup girls would go out there and they would they would constantly touch her up, right? And they were following everything they could get their hands on about makeup and everything Hubbard had ever read, written. Mm. So we called this guy up. This was the beginning of their getting professional training, who was, uh, he, this guy had made every president, he'd done every president's makeup up to Clinton. And he had the highest national security clearance of any makeup artist. And if you know who Henry Hill is, he's the, the, the mafia gangster who was featured in Goodfellas. Okay? Mm, mm -hmm. He was the guy who was called in by Secret Service to do Henry Hill's makeup when they had to move Henry Hill from place to place. Okay, So this was a substantial guy. Wow. And he used to tell, tell me crazy stories about Henry Hill, about how he just showed up at his house one day in Burbank. And and the guy was like, Henry, you have to get out of here. I, I'm going to we're all going to get killed. Uh, anyway, it, it's part wow. of a story of you, you never want to do a favor for a mafia guy. Eh. But you'll be you'll be beholden to them forever. Right. Um, or rather, you never want to accept a favor. Right. You know? Right. Because it's just uh, anyway. So, that, yeah, uh, you once know, you get I, in, you can't get out. That's for sure. Yeah, you're done. So I yeah. brought this guy in, this very, very famous makeup artist. I brought him in and he he went through the girls. Uh, makeup kits and he was just furious he would start throwing things away and yelling at them and it was just great wow. i was just loving it he's like why are there dirty makeup sponges in your kit you use these on more than once ah, ah, you know and he's just like <laughs> running these girls through drills like some old sea or you know drill wow sponge. yeah it was great and then he said here's the problem the reason you guys are failing on this film because the environment is so dirty uh, her skin, her pores, uh, you can't just put more makeup on her. You have to take her off the set once an hour and you have to scrub her face clean with soap and water and start right. over. And this is going to add a bunch of time to your shooting, but it's the only way you're ever going to get the film done. Right. Because she so had to, and, and for people who don't know or have no idea what we're talking about in terms of the the, the format or the, the, the context of the film, right. it's an angel in hell. Who's yeah, salvaging real a person with a because security I, check, yeah, right? Because I insisted we shoot the film with real fire. Yeah. Like like we used a little bit of artificial lighting to enhance the fire, but that environment was like, you know, we were dying. It sometimes was 120 degrees in there. I mean, it was nuts. Yeah, it looked, but, it looked hot. Yeah, it was. It was, And, and there was a were... lot of makeup on that set because you had guys who were the, the damned, who were yeah. laying in all these different contorted positions. Yeah. And sometimes you Dead couldn't even recognize and... there was a person there because they were covered in all this sooty makeup and they were kind of, you know, yeah. appear yeah, out but... of nowhere and stuff. So it was quite a, yeah, it we was just quite a shoot. A, they, 
but that, w that was just we established them and then we were done with that for the most of the film it was just yeah. the angel and her her pre-clear person she was auditing but yeah. so uh you know and, and yeah it was pretty nuts so um yeah yeah he really saved our bacon on that so you know uh in spite of all of the cine eds there's there's always going to be circumstances that that hover never came up with and the interesting thing about the cine eds is that people don't a lot of that you should be aware of, and a lot of people don't know this is that he only wrote them because someone screwed something up. Mm. Well, like if somebody screwed up how to balance sound on a set, then there would be a cine ed how to balance sound. There, it wasn't a cine ed; it was a scathing reprimand to a certain individual, right? Saying this is how you do it, and then that person would be, you know, of uh, disciplined ethics, RPF, whatever, right? And then somebody would take that and they'd compile it into a cine ED and they'd clean it up and make it really nice. And they'd say how to balance that, you know, it would, oh, you get what I'm saying? So okay. if you wanted to know the reason there's 500 cine EDs is because there was no less than 500 massive errors made. And then he addressed each one of those. It wasn't like he sat down and went, I'm going to write, you know, essay upon essay upon essay. Um, about how you do certain things, right? Uh, okay. Like there was one called Responsibility of the Director, and that was written to a guy who had completely been irresponsible as a director. So his answer was to write that as any of you. Right. It's, yeah, there's a, it's just like on the Apollo, you know, so I read this in like somebody's book, uh, maybe it was Janice's book, that about some orgies that supposedly happened on the Apollo, right? Mm -hmm. That there were a lot of these young messengers that were just banging each other in the engine rooms right and then somebody that you know they they hold up this this hubbard uh e, this hubbard uh issue that about sex on the ship right that there's that but but, but there's not going to be this is you can't do this you can't and they go no this was our policy on the ship well the only reason he wrote the policy is because the place was like you can tell you can go oh a lot of people were doing it on the ship or That's he right. never would have written it exactly so, uh, Exactly. Yeah, and, but then, then they use that to prove that that you know they're 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 as they're as pure as the driven snow, and That's nothing right. like that ever happened. So that was the deal with the CD. So and there was a lot of good information in them because he was culling from really good books. You know the basic standard books that you'll find in every good film school, like you know, right. in, in including Sergei Eisenstein. You know the famous. Uh, Russian director that we studied at length in our early film school days. Mm. Um, so that was like, there were all these required books. I'd read them all uh, already, so I didn't have to go back and reread them. But I, I probably did go back and reread Eisenstein because you can, it's just that such great stuff to write. You can never get enough of that. Well, yeah, it's I, just, yeah, it's, it, it bears a, a, another look sometimes. Um, how interesting, though, that he that his. So, are you saying that his style of of directing or running people was similar to Miscavige's in that he would bust somebody for not getting it right the first time, write down how to do it for the next guy, while he's punishing the first guy who who just didn't get it right anyway, and now he's not yeah, there. Yeah, or or the first guy was going to go back and do it again. I mean, quite okay. often, you know, they would keep that guy in there, but he, he would he would have to go through whatever he would go through. But, uh, you know, because right. I there was uh, I think Janice mentioned there were ten films when I was talking with with her about the red sharp thing she and i was mentioning to her about how miss gavage was constantly like saying that red sharp was the guy that screwed the films up and she said well that sounds like the tech because she was with she would have been with him on the original 10 tech films right. which was a very similar situation where people were being blamed blah 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 you know right and there are a number of the tech films shot under either by hubbard or under his having somebody do it under him one of the messengers or or Cyric gold staff uh, or staff at W. And there was a couple of them that were never released because they were so bad. And I watched them, uh, you know, just because they there was communication back and forth with Hubbard about that film. So it was pertinent for me to watch it. It's just stuff was horrible. I mean, it was just like unbelievable. So I think what what is missing from this conversation 
is that it doesn't matter what you read or what you study. There's this thing called taste and talent. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to really pull anything off if you don't have good taste. You need good taste is, is the ability to look at a thing and understand its nature in terms of what it's communicating to people, mm -hmm. you know, um, and so I found that there wasn't a lot of taste and there wasn't a lot of talent. So it kind of was, it kind of was, it wasn't so much that they were steeped in all this crazy shit. It was this, they were kind of like the bland leading the bland, if you know what I mean. Okay. Okay. Got it. Got it on that. Well, how interesting. And then yeah, you because kinda... you can't, you can't make, you know, I mean, th there's a, in my world, there's a, pretty well-known book called The Myth of Talent, which was actually written by, I'm trying to think of his name, but an artist, a very successful painter who's a Scientologist, uh, Larry Gluck, who started Mission Renaissance, the mm. painting schools for kids. Mm -hmm. And Larry wrote a, a wonderful book, actually, called The Myth of Talent, where he, he talks about the fact that you can take pretty much anybody and teach them to be a good artist. They just need the right training. And he's really right to some degree, but it always involves a sort of mentorship for that to happen and there really was no time or space at gold for mentor for mentors and mentees you know and apprentices and so forth do you that, think that, that uh-huh yeah that just didn't happen i mean eventually i was able to get somebody assigned to me who i thought had a lot of talent and desire and after seven years he could go on the set and direct shots and do a good job hmm do you think that that is somehow informed by Hubbard's policy that you have to, in the Sea Org, there are very clear-cut flag orders. This isn't, this isn't, this doesn't always bleed down or come down to the public level or staff mm -hmm. level, but it, but often it does, but not all the time. But there are clear-cut flag orders that talk about how you need to get it right the first time. You're fully professional. Stop pretending you aren't. You know yeah. what to do. Make it go right. You've done everything I'm ever going to ask you to do before a million times in a million lifetimes. So stop pretending you don't know what to do. That's an attitude that Hubbard expressed yeah. In, a, in a number of places yeah. and it's a sea org attitude it's not you're going to become ot it's that you are ot and in, you know me, meaning you are already cause over matter energy space time life and form and stop pretending you're not yeah. right do you think that attitude might be underlying a lot of this nonsense with the with oh. the punishment drive and the lack of creativity I have no doubt that it's anything but that because yeah. it's strictly an attitude. I mean, you have a lack of taste and a lack of talent, but then you have something that's blocking you from even moving forward. Right. So, and that's what that is. I mean, no, absolutely. Yeah. That, that is 100% covers that, that. You're expected to go in, do the course, then you're expected to drill it. Then you're expected to show up 100% ready to be brilliant. And if you're not, your lack of uh, competence is identified with you being unwilling to display it. There and that go. is just so dangerous. You know, like I used to say, Chris, like after I kind of got roped into the whole deal, you know, I finished a film and it went well. And, and I, you know, I, I, we've talked, I haven't, wasn't trying to break any records or do anything special. I was just, and, and then, you know, I, I found it impossible to disentangle myself from this operation. And I used to joke, oh, yeah, I got my biggest, uh, my biggest crime was displaying my competence. And I, and because, you know, when you do something right, if the wrong people are expecting you to do it again, and you don't really know it, like, but they're demanding that you do it again. And the only reason you wouldn't do it again is because you have a lack of willingness and what's beneath a lack of willingness. Whoa, something very evil. You, you're, you're really stuck in a trap. So, yeah, I mean, it's, that's the end of the conversation, Chris. What you just said, there's nothing more to be said about it. I, I, I think that that does nail it. And I think that yeah. it's very interesting how much can spring from simplicities like that. How much complexity and noise and yeah. entanglements and conflict can can spring from something that looks empowering it looks yeah. like and, and and until you experience it and, and we've described it quite well 
But until you experience it, you can take a piece of information like what Hubbard's writing about. You have to be OT to go OT. And you can use it as a very self-empowering sort of thing. Oh, yes, I am all there. I am all th that there is that needs to be. And I'm going to go out and I'm going to do the job. And I'm going to be a little Spielberg, right? You're supposed to show up on set first day like you're a little Spielberg. And if you don't, it's because you don't want to. It's because you don't. It's because you have right. other intentionness or counter intentions. Right. In other words, you're right. out ethics, right? right? And here come this array of tools we're going to use to discipline you and and make you into you know stop being such an evil person. And that's the entire attitude of Scientology right. correction in a nutshell. There is right. none. You know, it's just you're just, you're just evil and you must be destroyed. And it, and and it exactly sets up the situation you just described where maybe you do pull off a miracle and you make it go right once, but you flow by the seat of your pants, you're learning as you're going, you're just you're you're figuring yeah. it out. And then you go into project number two because now that you've proven you can do it. You're the guy who's gonna keep doing it because all these other fools couldn't even get it right one time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, and then you're on the firing line for the second time, and this time you do make a mistake because you're not perfect, and you are learning as you go, and then you're cast on the trash heap with everybody else because you screwed up, because you're out ethics, because you didn't really want to do the job in the first place. Blah 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 blah. All these horrible assumptions yeah. that get made about yeah. you, and that yeah, kind of seems to be the entire culture. It's a to very toxic environment. I mean, you've described it exactly. And it's, mm -hmm. and then, you know, it's sort of like, it's kind of like if you remember in the Dynamics book, I don't know why I just thought of this, but yeah. the upside down pyramid, do you remember that? Like how the analogy of the reactive mind is an upside down pyramid. Mm -hmm. it, it, and, mm -hmm. and so you have at the, at the very basic, at the very bottom you of the pyramid, the peak, because it's upside down. At the peak, you have the basic, basic engram, the one that's holding everything else in place. Right? right. Well, the mindset is very much like that. But what's holding it all in place is that there's this mission that you have no time. It's humanity in the balance. It's I think the best way to define it is is the how high are the stakes for what you're doing, right? Yeah. So if you're in film school, if you're in a situation where we're here to teach you and we're here to learn from our mistakes as opposed to, you know, we're traveling at light speed into a black hole and everybody has to be perfect all the time because that's right. just the nature of the mission. And so it's kind of like everything is held together by that bottom of that upside down pyramid, which is this mission, which is just, the, it's horrifically stressful and it all starts which is it's my my realization of this week while i was doing the gold video it really starts with your idealism like you hook your idealism yeah. up to this thing it's like you know hooking your wagon to a star kind of thing but that's right there's so much in scientology that especially in terms of the group and the community uh, that is is about uh, harnessing your own your own idealism and idealism is like something you do in your head right mm -hmm. like it's a mind thing i it even has the word idea in it right that's right so and and then you hook it up with like no we're going to save the world no the you know blah 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 and i, I think we all inherently want to get involved with something that's bigger than us you know all these basic things so the next thing you know you're being dragged towards this at the at warp speed towards this impossible goal and you're being made to feel responsible for it that's right that's right I, I and might, there's no I, I, room I'm, there's no room yeah. for error there because they no, no, because no. of these trump these exaggerated these hyperbolic ideals that are put forward yeah that we bought into you, you bought into yeah. it i bought into it. i mean i really bought into it man i was a hundred percent right we all were like we, we did, were like, saving totally. the world Oh, completely. It, people like, you know, like some born again comes to your your door and they and you just you can feel in their heart. They know that if you do not accept Jesus Christ as your savior, you're going to burn in hell. Right. And you just like, I don't I don't I, I have sort of a kind of a weird empathy for these people. Mm -hmm. Right. But then we were the same way in Scientology. That's right. So you, 
you we really are saving you for eternity it was just crazy but you know i just i have to add that i ended up with some very talented guys on the crew like the guy who's still the cameraman up there and the guy who who took over for me as a director i had some really good people but then there was always you know you talk about these people that they screw up and they get pulled out of there and blah 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 but I always had a, at least one, if not two or three people that were so incompetent. And I would just beg, you know, the qualification division and ethics and I would please get them off the crew, you know, and and, and in many cases, their previous history in, in Scientology, in the Sea Org had been, they'd been in some other administrative function and done well. Can you please send them back there? And there were these some people I could not get rid of. And you just had to, had to you had to compensate. It's almost like, I don't know what your experience was, but it's almost like I only met two kinds of people at this year. People that were really smart and really competent or people that were just lost and they were just idiots. And I, I don't know. There is no gray area, it seems. Well, it seems to me that a big reason why that happens, and I totally, totally get what you're saying, um, and I can talk about this from my own experience because I was on both sides of, I was considered in both ways over the years in Scientology, <laughs> yeah. right? I was the hero and Where I was the all? villain, right? As we all yeah. were. Yeah. And I think that that speaks to why that happens because it is a matter of not only getting busted for doing your best, but you then have the demoralizing, you know, journey of, well, I did my best and I and I must be evil because I couldn't bring, you know, the Spielberg quality, right? And so you so there's the there's the path of doing yourself in through your idealism and you turn that energy in on yourself and and push yourself down. And you end up being incompetent at everything at that point because you have no self confidence, your self image is shattered. Yeah. Or you're busting people who actually were doing a decent job, but it just wasn't good enough or some other trumped up bullshit. They know yeah. that they shouldn't have been busted, but here they are busted. Now they're in the galley. Now they're on the decks. Now they're in the grounds crew. Now they're doing something else that they never wanted to do and didn't sign on for and truly aren't any good at. And yeah. now they got to do it because they couldn't do the job they were actually trained to do because they screwed up once. Yeah. You know? Of course. Yeah, I never experienced that. But oh, no, I, I sure I did. Know, yeah, no, yeah. I know. But, the, I mean, the difference with me is I got asked to come up there and participate in something that I'd been doing for years and that I was competent at. So, right. Where a lot of people join this tour because they really – they just want to help. And they they'll get shuffled around a lot. That's right. To different jobs, but even That's in right. my worst, my worst moment, you know, of being in trouble, that was just like. Well, you, you know, see I this. Was, you, you I never see... felt incompetent about what I was doing. I just and and you shouldn't. And you had yeah, enough I, I certainty did. and enough production under your belt that you yeah. knew what you knew. Yeah. You know, and yeah, those so and, I, uh, yeah. That wasn't a thing for me. So then it all came onto my my sort of character you know what i'm mm -hmm. saying character mm -hmm. like it's always still going to be there however they get to you like yep. they couldn't get to me that way but you begin to believe that your character is so flawed that's right you know that you 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 failed scientology like you really start to believe that after a while that's right because you can't live up to their standard and so that you failed them they it, it's so deleterious to one's own perception of your core uh personality you know i was thinking right. about this the other day if i can just throw this in yeah yeah please there's this profound difference between dianetics and scientology that i don't think uh, i had a lot of discussions about this especially with miscavige i had something i had to think about a lot mm. because i i did all of this dianetics material you know i did all the ads then i did all the infomercials then i did i had to use dianetics video at least twice and that thing was you know, four and a half hours long. And the stupidest reason I redid it was because the actor I cast in it, we loved his voice so much, we actually realized we wanted him to be the narrator. And and all of our other narrators had said, fuck you to the church because of all the bad press. And so I couldn't have the guy acting in it be the narrator. So uh. I yanked him out of it and reshot all of his scenes uh, so I could use him as the narrator because I was so 
so set on getting the correct narrator, but and then moving from that into doing stuff for Scientology, you know, doing uh, public films like Orientation and doing the Register films and blah blah blah, the, the, all that stuff. That there's this fundamental difference between Dianetics and Scientology, which is that it, Dianetics is the subject about what happened to you. Mm -hmm. It's the subject about all of the bad shit that 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 befell you, you know. From uh, and Scientology is about all the shit you did, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden it switches. You you sort of get roped in on this level of wow, I really did go through a lot of bad stuff, and I really would like to heal from it. To well, you did that to yourself. You made that mm -hmm. happen. You're responsible. Mm -hmm. And it's just, you know, it's just kind of, uh, I, don't, I don't think people think about that uh, enough. That Well, Hubbard even commented on it at one point. Yeah, it's a, not some know. big secret. He, he actually yeah. literally talks about that. That's so right. It, it's part of a known deal. But when you really experience it, when you really experience it on the level of how damaging that can be in terms of your own self-perception, I mean... I don't know that asking yourself what you may have done to contribute to, to something that somebody did to you. I don't know that that isn't that, that in, in, in many contexts isn't a valid question, but if anybody's asking it, but you of yourself, mm -hmm. you're in deep trouble because that person is there to do nothing but to manipulate you. Like we mm -hmm. saw with the Masterson victims saying right. you caused this, what did you do is so different from, maybe some time out between when it happened and and wherever you are asking yourself is there something i did is there something i need to do differently i think at least from where i am right now that's okay that's like in some cases can be a healthy thing to do mm -hmm. even though you you mm -hmm. were 100 percent victimized but to have somebody else engage you in that conversation that's what i think is so damaging and that's tricky because if it's a thing that might help you if you ask yourself, yet how does it become so evil when somebody else is asking? Well, it does. Okay. So. Well, I'll tell you, I I think you're bringing up a very very crucial point, almost a focal point of of what I would call the recovery process, because I I can um, remember very clearly in my own process and speaking about this with others that. That there does come a, a a point of sort of reconsideration, where when I first and when I, most other people come out of cults or come out of a coercive situation or abusive situation, you're very hyper aware of the fact that you were abused, you were victimized, you were made to do things or say things or be things, or endure things that nobody ever should have put on you. And that happens, and that happens every day, 24-7, all over the world. People victimize other people. And through no fault of their own. I mean, people are just victimized. Kids, women, men, it happens. And we're hyper aware of that status, of that fact, when we come out of these situations, because that's why we get out of them, is we're, holy cow, this is abusive. This is wrong. I shouldn't let this person keep doing this to me. And we do let them do it because we're idealistic or we've accepted some foundation or principles or beliefs that, mm -hmm. that rationalize it. And we finally wake up and go, hey, this isn't okay. And we step out and we realize we've been victimized and we talk about that a lot. And we get a lot of support and sympathy and, and, and understanding for that and compassion. And those are all very, very good and contextually accurate, appropriate things. But after a few years of that, <laughs> you start realizing, wait a second, with all this victimization going on, did I ever victimize everybody? Anybody? <laughs> yeah. Right? And you start thinking about that. And you go, hang on. Yeah, I was victimized, but you know what? I kind of contributed to this motion too a little bit, right? Dare I, you know what I mean? Like even even the, the, the damn objectives, right? Follow my motion, contribute to them, right? Sure. Uh, but you realize that is kind of how it happened, is that is mm -hmm. that because of those ideals, because of those beliefs, because of the, that you bought into, you thought in that time and place, it was totally okay to beat on this person or invalidate them or, or send them to the RPF or declare them suppressive and disconnect them from their families. I did that to people. And once I started having to own that, 
you start going, oh, there's a third dimension to this picture. It's not just the two-dimensional picture of me being beaten on by somebody else. There's a deeper picture here where, oh, yeah, a little bit earlier, I was the one beaten on somebody. Oh, my God. And that whole thing comes to light. And I think for me, that's been the process. I've seen it with other people. And I think it takes time. And I think it takes a great deal of building up your self-image and your self-confidence again in yourself to come to the point where you can acknowledge that you were also part of that problem. You know, because if you can only be the victim, I think there's something wrong. Because we're not only just victims. We also are right. responsible for some of the things that we have done. Yeah. Not everything, but some of it. Wise words. You know, and I think sorting that out is exactly what you just described. And I, th and I think yeah. I've, I, I've had to deal with that same thing. And it's, it's a balance. And I think that recovery yeah. has everything to do with finding and f your balance and your perspective again so that you can recognize that it wasn't all just done to you. It's not all just a one-way flow kind of thing. You know, and in that sense, I'm willing to go, yeah, absolutely. That's a, that would be a good thing. But everything hinges on where you're at to be able to do that path. Because if you can't take that responsibility or you're not willing to look at that yet or you're not there yet, well, then that's where you're at, you know. And no, mm -hmm. nobody else can push that and force that on you because if they do, it just becomes more of that same kind of manipulation. Right, right. You know? Well, I think in terms of my abusing others, I was like a B-52 pilot who was dropping bombs on <laughs> innocent villagers sure. from a distance because of what I did in terms of media and so forth, because sure. uh, I was never in a position to send people to the RPF. Although I do have one guy who says that I threatened him with that. So. Mm. <laughs> Hey, but, you know, I'll yeah. tell you, I forgot more than I remember as far as all my experiences. And when I have, yeah. when, and, and it was a real, it was a real, um, it, it's always a little bit of an awakening, but it's also, I think, a positive step forward when we're mm -hmm. contacted by other people who we knew at the time and they tell us something we did and we totally forgot about it, right? Yeah. We're like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. You're right. I did that. And I was such an <laughs> asshole. I'm so sorry, right? And I love having those opportunities to yeah. apologize. <laughs> yeah, no, I was you know? actually talking about somebody who said it 20 years ago. I've, yeah, yeah. Just I, saying. You know, this is why we need to keep talking, Chris, because yeah. I only get people reaching out to me telling me how much I help them. Yeah. Um, either that, I'm serious. It's yeah, just yeah. like my, my self victimization was one of being a little too much of a catcher in the rye kind of character trying to you know, make things better for other people. So right. I was a little bit of a person pleaser in that way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know anything about what yeah, you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. You I wasn't like I know. that they, at all. <laughs> yeah. And they, they didn't talk about that when you got your degree, I'm sure. So no, no, not at all. Not at all. Yeah. They, no, they of they course. The, skipped that whole thing. You want the ratio of course, of people you're going to talk to post cult to mostly hopefully be, yeah. you know, good. And, and for me, yes. they have been, you know, it's I'm a sure. handful of people, but it's wonderful when it happens because it, yeah. it allows you to kind of put some of that stuff to rest you know yeah i know for sure for sure yeah it's mm. and plus the one of the things that amazes me is that uh people who've left who i knew when i when i was in like friends i had yep. as you know friendlies i had because we don't have friends uh people that i knew in the sea Org that i didn't particularly like mm -hmm. that how much how likable they are now <laughs> so you know I yep. mean, there are, it's always going to be people you didn't like then. You're not going to like them now because you don't get along with everybody. That's right. But it, it is amazing. I've had to stop myself a couple of times and go, no, you know what? I'm, I, and they go, wow, this person, they're just so different. They're so likable because people are under those kind of pressures. They're not themselves. Exactly. Exactly. And in fact, that's, that's the biggest understatement of our entire interview so far in terms Probably. of, uh, you know, uh, truths. I mean, it's, it, it, they are literally not themselves. You know, yeah. when you're in a cult mindset, what we really mean by that is that your ideals have overtaken your rationality. 
it, that's, yeah. that's kind of what yeah, it means to be totally. in a cult is you're yeah. operating on a set of ideals that are so unrealistic and so stupid if you actually thought about it. But yeah. you don't think about it because you're so caught up in the in the you know inspirational you know greatness of it that you that you know that you and that's that the, the energy of that is what tends to impel us forward through all the abuses and nonsense yeah, for years. Absolutely, you know. Yeah, it's really quite. I mean, something. I, I, I when I was going through this gold video um, to make a reaction video, I, I, I mean, I was kind of stopped a number of times, just having to come to terms with. The things that I said and and the the level of enthusiasm that I had about these things, I was like, oh my god, yeah. You know, you you, you want to set it all straight, but you also uh, you kind of want to protect yourself, like you, you know, what I'm saying, you know, yeah. there is a, a kind of an instinct to protect yourself, but yeah, I, I have to do another one uh, on uh, the. The 2020 thing I did speaking out against Ron Miscavige. Mm. That's because that's the you know about that one. Mm -hmm. Well, we talked about yeah, it in terms of the baker's yeah, dozen yeah, that they that she that uh, what's her name arrived with. <laughs> the, oh the, yeah, with the, the baked bakers. goods. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I love that story. I think it's hilarious. Yeah. It really, I mean, I'm telling you, you really clarified some things for me about Miscavige just with that cupcake story. Oh, my God. You know, what is Mike Rinder has a name for her? Uh, Monique Muffins Monique. Yes, I think <laughs> Monique she, yeah. yeah, she did it another time. Uh, I'm trying to think when it was. There was another time she had to appear on ABC. Yeah. And, and she showed up with baked goods. It's just like a thing they do. Yeah, it's so weird. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. It it's, really is. It's so weird. Um, well, let me ask you about one other thing, and then maybe we'll sure. um, see about wrapping up today. But I did want to ask you about okay. this because you brought it up before. Uh, do we want to talk about that Dynetics thing? Did you want to bring that up? Oh, Oh yeah, we could do that. Yeah, yeah. that's just a, you got? a curiosity that I have. That, yeah. um, yeah, it just a real, if there's any uh, if there's any kernel or seed of validity, random, accidental, purposeful mm -hmm. between Dianetics auditing and exposure therapy. Mm -hmm. Seeing that at the time when Hubbard was developing exposure therapy, I believe that it was a, a bit of a is this idea of going back through your trauma uh, to sort of heal from it. And it's, you know, obviously it still exists as exposure therapy. Uh, um, and so I just wondered because people, there's so many people who have experienced some form of success with Dianetics and it was so huge. I mean, the, it's hard to take a therapy like that and turn it into a cult, even though, as you pointed out, a lot of the uh, criticisms of Hubbard's work the Dianetics book pointed that those pointed out the fact that this was ripe to be called material. But I think because there's an end to Dianetics, there's sort of this, you know, maybe it's clear, maybe it's mm -hmm. uh, recovering from the main trauma that was bothering you. And these things that have an end, in other words, that people graduate and, and then leave, they're not a good business model to build a cult around. You need to keep that continuous conveyor belt going. That's right. So, and that's where Scientology just, comes if, in. Yeah, exactly. I'd wondered what you thought about if you had any, because I know you and I talked about that, and I mentioned, yeah. I, you know, I think it might. I think it's speculative. I, I'm certainly not recommending that anybody go read the Dianetics book, uh, and you know, grab yeah. a friend and and do the auditing because it's just like. Well, there's a there's a couple things that I'll comment on here about this because this is an, this has definitely been a subject of interest for me over the last you know decade. And right, right. there's regression therapy, ab reaction therapy, psychoanalysis, and exposure therapy. And these two these things are often kind of conflated. They are different things, but they but Scientology and Dianetics specifically are a bit of a mesh or mix of some of these things. And so right. we can use these terms to sort of talk about Dianetics from right. a certain perspective or angle it's not strictly speaking exposure therapy the exposure therapy by definition is a technique used by therapists to help people overcome fears and anxieties by uh, exposing them to the stimulus that caused fear but they're in a safe environment now so if you're afraid right. of snakes we're going to have you go look at some snakes for real Right. Or we're going to have you, and then we're going to have you gradually approach them. Maybe eventually, after days or weeks of this, maybe you'll start touching them. That kind of right. thing. It's a gradual sort of thing. 
That has a limited degree of workability. There are studies that you can look up on this, and, and some people respond to this, others don't. It's a variable technique. Um, regression therapy would be the same thing, where you're regressing back to your childhood to remember past traumas and stresses, right? Psychoanalysis would get into this, Freudian psychoanalysis would. So there's kind of a mix of stuff going on here. And I wondered myself about this for many years. I had the exact same question. And so the, so the things I'm talking about right now are some of the answers I found. <laughs> The other thing that I found that, that kind of clicked for me and made some things make sense to me in, for, for my experience of Dianetics was something that Jordan Peterson, of all people, said one day. And Jordan Peterson's not somebody that I you know, particularly follow avidly. I think his politics right. are you know, something I can disagree with quite strongly. But when he talks on his professional expertise as a clinical psychologist, he has interesting things to say. And one of the things that he said was that through a kind of uh, regression or past trauma therapy, you can have a person click in or realize their responsibilities or their contributions to past traumas or past incidents of stress. And that it kind of reframes and reworks their perspective on their past behavior and what was done to them as well as what they did. And that's about it. That's about all he said. But just the idea of that was enough to go, oh, maybe that's why Dianetics works sometimes. Even if, even if the person doesn't necessarily realize it. It's like, oh, my mom wasn't really responsible for that. I'm the guy who put the cap on the bottle. Ah, right. You know, or whatever, right? You're remembering right. stuff you didn't remember before. Or you're, re, you're giving it a new perspective. Right. You know? And right. there's catharsis to be found there. And, and it's, is it universal? Is it 100%? Is it going to make you clear? No. But it does work sometimes for some people and therefore can be not Dianetics therapy I'm talking about here. I'm not talking about going through the whole thing, but this, this, this theoretical approach of, of we're going to address past trauma to deal with current trauma or current anxiety has some degree of workability and studies tend to back this up, but it's not majority. It's a minority of people that this works on. That's what I have found in my years of, of work on that. Interesting. Yeah. It, well, that answers my question. There we go. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Last subject, okay? Yeah. Were you, or have you ever come across the drug rehab uh, facility from back in the 70s, uh, Synodon? Oh, in the 60s. Yeah, yeah. Synodon. Yeah, 60s, that, was a, yeah. That, was a big, uh, that was a big cult thing. Yeah. Uh, well, snakes in the mailbox. Cult, yeah. <laughs> Yes, yeah, it didn't okay. start yeah, out it, that way, but it got it, no, no, it degraded. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, but it was exactly the, the reason I bring it up is yeah. recently I had friends who went to Synod. Uh, I almost went there. Yep. Um, that was I was it was an alternative for me when I was trying to get up a drug. The right. reason I brought it up is because the the uh, the trajectory that they took from being a lifestyle centered. Um, the drug rehab that was a darling of the media. They had celebrities like, you know, Leonard Nimoy used to go out there and do acting classes. They had famous musicians. They had a place on the on the beach in Santa Monica. You know, when you drive down to Highway 1, you go down in Santa Monica, whatever that street is, down the ramp, right there, that four-story, you know, 100,000 square foot building. They had a number of other facilities. I mean, they were huge. They were liked in the community. They were written about well in the press. Yep. They opened their doors to non-addicts. They started a whole community that was about healing and growth. And then they ended up becoming a militarized, dangerous cult. People went to prison. And I, I had recently listened uh, to a podcast produced by uh, Robert Downey Jr.'s company. He and his wife produced podcasts. Oh. And uh, they, they, yeah, it was probably a tie-in with movies somehow, but it's on Apple. There's a number of things on Synonym, but Synonym, Synonym, but <laughs> you can find theirs. I don't remember the name, but it's easy. You can find theirs. And I forget the name of their company, but it's definitely produced by Robert Downey Jr. and his, his wife. Wow. And it's really wonderful. And I listened to it, I think it was last summer. And I was thinking, you know, this is the trajectory of a cult. This is like, it cannot go any other way. So. Mm -hmm. 
It's true. Uh, Primal Scream was a was a similar thing in the sixties and seventies. Yeah, it was a pseudo therapeutic cult, but a bunch of a bunch of psychologists went totally off the reservation. And wow. just just totally off the reservation, right? They were doing a, and this was a '60s thing that developed into the '70s. Was this sort of communal living, group therapy right. environment? Right. Total right. disaster. I mean, unhinged, complete disaster. But it started as though it was the most amazing thing ever, and this was going to be the next big thing in psychology. Interesting. So, yeah, very interesting. Well, I very. just wanted to put that out there. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, there are a lot of things out there that will produce, let me say this, there are a lot of things out there that will produce results, that will produce effects. The interpretation of those effects is everything to mm-hmm. how people think about them, right? If you eat a Twinkie and you feel bad, okay, cause effect. But if you eat a Twinkie and you're told that you've just devoured the cosmic consciousness of, you know, Krishna or something, and you feel bad, now that can be interpreted as somehow you're rejecting Krishna. And therefore, there's something wrong with you, right? And therefore... That's a really powerful Twinkie. It it is a real powerful Twinkie, right? That's that's a big Twinkie. But that's... that's, It's a silly analogy to demonstrate the point, right? No, 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 it's actually... No, it makes total sense. That yeah. The reason why is because it's like the big Twinkie. It's exactly. like it shows the silliness of it. Exactly. We it, it's how we interpret these events. You mm-hmm. can interpret feeling really good as a Jesus moment. You were touched by Krishna. You know the Thetan. Uh, you you exteriorized. <laughs> you can you can call it lots of different things. What it is is a set of sensations you're experiencing. That's what it is, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And it was a real I big see. moment for me to realize that that half of the battle in fighting pseudoscience and fighting against the woo woo that we run into in life, the alternative medicine crap and all that right. stuff, is it's really not about what you're feeling. It's about how you're told to interpret that feeling. Right. You know. What what it means. Exactly. What it means and what does that mean? Because, oh, I feel so good right now. That means in a Scientology comm course in the 1970s that you're exterior. Hmm. Oh, that's what this feeling is. That's what it is. And now we've proven you're a Thetan. Oh, my God, I'm a Thetan. This is wonderful. Scientology works, right? (laughs) All that's happened is you feel good right now. Mm -hmm. That's it. You know? So has a lot to do with that. Interesting. That's how I try to keep a level head these days. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah. well, I had an experience now. Before I jump to any conclusions about what that experience meant, <laughs> you know, let me give myself a little bit of time and perspective. Because the way cults get you is they jump on you and they insist right. this is it. And if you give us 99 bucks, you can get it again. <laughs> you know? Yeah. All right. Well, anyway, Mitch, thank you for all of this. Did you have any other things you wanted to bring up before we? No, uh... I'm I'm done. I'm I'm awesome. exhausted. I think we've beaten this to death. I, this was great, Chris. I love talking to you. Cool, it's, man. It's helpful. I hope that it's yeah. It's actually I always walk away from these conversations feeling enlightened, feeling uh, not Excellent. well. S- suddenly. Uh, you know, exterior. I just <laughs> excellent. Well, if you give me ninety nine bucks, and I'll have you on next yeah. week, and we'll do it again. <laughs> yeah, you take cards, right? That's right. I take cash yeah. credit. Cash your credit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, just all these anyway. old in Scientology no, tr- jokes. <laughs> yeah, truly. Oh man, I love it. I love it. I love it. All right, guys, thank you very much for tuning in this week and and listening to us ramble on here about this stuff. I hope you find it interesting, informative, and entertaining. I sure do. I, I like I said, I was looking forward to this for a long time. Mitch, you came through. You gave us the the goods. I really appreciate your time and attention on this, and your willingness to share. So thank you very much. You're very welcome, Chris. I hope we do it again soon. You bet we will. All right, guys out there, I will see you soon. Uh, Support the channel, and I will see you, well, next week. (laughs) Bye-bye.